Just when it seemed the pine beetle epidemic couldn't get any worse, there are new fears it could eventually spread all the way across the country. And that's the focus of tonight's NewsHour Insight. Here's Deb. It's really getting ugly, Chris. Parts of Prince George look like a war zone. In Kamloops, virtually every pine tree is either dead or dying. In Kelowna, a plywood plant is closing, putting 130 people out of work. And that's just some of the fallout from one of the worst disasters in the history of BC forestry. Tonight, we're starting a three-part series on the pine beetle crisis, beginning with the latest on the staggering scale of the infestation, which is now, as you said, Chris, threatening to go nationwide. Brian Coxford reports. These are not the colors of fall in the BC forest. They're the somber shades of death, and it's everywhere. On a sunny day, it's more glaring. But even under overcast skies, the stages of mortality from green to purple to red to gray blanket the forest in BC's caribou as far as the eye can see. The pine beetle epidemic, 10 times larger than anything else in our history, is devouring our pine forest faster than we can keep up with it dramatically altering the landscape with the destruction of millions of trees. An alarming sight for those who have spent their life working in the forest. We've never been able to fly the full extent of it. We get so frustrated flying around that we used to come back. Its natural enemy in the past has been extended freezing temperatures. But in a globally warming forest, weather is no longer killing the bug. It's now having its way in the pine stands in Manning Park, east of Hope, hitting parts of our province where it's never killed before. So the race is on to harvest as much of the dead pine as forest companies can, reducing the losses to the infected trees, which is now calculated at over $40 billion. Its volume so far over 400 cubic meters of timber, equal to more than three times the annual softwood production in all of Canada. That would make about uh, six and a half million homes. And to get a sense of how uh, many homes that is, uh, annually in the United States, they build about 1.9 million. So what's that, three and a half uh, times? The annual housing starts in the United States has already been attacked in British Columbia softwood lumber. When the beetles attack a tree, there's literally thousands of them. And uh, they multiply tenfold, go out and attack other trees. The result being five years ago, the killing zone in British Columbia was the size of Vancouver Island. Now it's almost the size of Sweden. There have always been pine beetles here, but in much lower numbers, allowing nature to keep them at bay. This infestation started back 11 years ago in a couple of tiny pockets in and around Tweedsmere Provincial Park, south of Smithers. By 2001, the bugs were consuming pine from Smithers to Williams Lake. Today, its volume has ballooned to almost a third of the provincial forest, moving this summer into the Peace River region and through the mountain passes into Alberta, around Grand Prairie and east of Jasper. The boxes in the Canadian Forest Service greenhouses hold sections of trees cut two weeks ago in the Peace River region, and there's no doubt the beetle has claimed another big chunk of BC. This is a very dense attack. Um, there's a lot of beetles here. Uh, but they're doing well because, as you can see, uh, we have these are, are, are well-developed, mature larvae um, that are exactly where you expect them to be, sort of uh, heading into wintertime in, in a healthy population. University of Northern BC researchers have captured pine beetles in nets flying at 800 meters. Moving with the jet stream, they've navigated the Rockies, reaching Alberta's pine forests. It means next stop could be the jack pine, plentiful in the boreal forest, a largely untouched wilderness covering 35% of Canada. With global warming, the hungry beetles could make it all the way to the east coast, through an area where three billion land birds and half of North America's waterfowl live. Indeed, much of the boreal forest in the very near future will be uh, climatically suitable for mountain pine beetles. The blue stain is evidence the mountain pine beetle has claimed another tree. Bluewood makes up over 90% of the inventory at North Central BC Mills, and it will keep them busy for decades to come. We know that we're probably going to be cutting this for 20 years, and now basically it is beetlewood. We, we are focused on bringing beetlewood in and leaving the greenwood for our future. Beetle kill has cost BC taxpayers $8 billion in lost stumpage fees so far, money not available to spend on health and education. And here's a little more on how big and bad the pine beetle epidemic has become. It is now generally considered to be the largest such infestation ever recorded in the history of North America. 
The pine beetle has gone through nearly 9 million hectares of lodgepole pine in BC. That's almost two-thirds of all the pine in the province. There are only about 4 million hectares left. And it grows exponentially. Each infected pine tree can produce enough beetles to infect another 10 to 12 trees. The only two things that can stop it, a 40 below zero cold snap that lasts for at least three weeks or a forest fire. Tomorrow night, the nuts and bolts of this epidemic, how and why has the tiny pine beetle gone from being a beneficial part of the forest ecosystem to becoming public enemy number one? You have a tree, which is a massive organism capable of producing all kinds of defensive compounds. And yet, you've got a beetle the size of a grain of rice that can kill it. And not only kill one tree, but billions of trees. Canadian forest scientist Alan Carroll is an expert, having studied the destructive nature of the mountain pine beetle for years. He says the beetles carry a blue fungus in their mouths. The fungus spreads through the outer rings of the tree cutting off the flow of sap with its defensive toxic resin that would normally repel the beetles. That gives them free access to the tree, allowing the beetle's year-long life cycle to unfold. As she, she uh, digs her tunnel, um, she packs the, uh, the, uh, the, the boring dust behind her, um, creating sort of a plugged uh, tunnel. But along the edges of it, she lays her eggs, and these eggs will hatch. Uh, and the young larvae will begin burrowing outward, sort of perpendicular to this gallery that she creates. Over the last decade, that beetle has been able to attack and kill timber valued at $40 billion to date. It's all happening with our help. Through whole-scale fire suppression, there are 75% more pine trees than 35 years ago. And we've contributed to climate change, giving us warmer winters. It's allowed the bug to move non-stop in its own perfect storm. We've uh, ensured that there's a lot of susceptible pine for mountain pine beetle, and we've done this uh, largely through fire suppression. We have removed fire uh, as a disturbance agent in most of the pine forests almost entirely. In fact, uh, our data show that less than 1% of the area uh, that we uh, um, burns today in pine forests than what we would expect to burn based upon 100 years ago. And tests by the BC Forest Service singling out and burning beetle kill plots of forest show we now have a different kind of forest fire threat. At high risk, the red kill, the early stages, they produce fast-moving crown fires. At lower risk, five to six-year-old gray stands where the needles have fallen. And as the dead beetle trees finally fall to the ground, the fire risk is again high. Historically, with green pine, we'd have very small fires here. One, two, three hectares would be a large fire. With the red pine, uh, in the last three years, we've had twice now, we've had fires that have gone to 10,000 hectares in a day. The needles are almost as explosive as dry hay. Uh, it's almost like they're soaked with gasoline. It's very, very difficult to fight fire. In fact, you can't. When it starts to roll, the best you can do is get all your people out of the way. There are lots of issues as to how the beetle is having an effect on the forest, not only killing trees, the water table has changed because these trees are no longer sucking up water. Where's the water going? And what effect will that have on reforestation in a wetter forest? So we can feel the damp. Here we are in uh, early fall. This should be all dry, shouldn't it? Yeah. It's, it's sand. It's sand and it's wet. It's going to be a new learning curve for us. We'll have to understand how we deal with this kind of ground now that it's changing. It means the heavy logging equipment has to travel with a softer footprint. Wheels have to be wider and doubled to cut and haul the deadwood. Still valuable timber that has to be harvested in order to recoup the value from this natural disaster in our forest. A war with the bug we apparently can't win. From the standpoint of doing anything against the outbreak, uh, I've often said that uh, it, it's like a bucket of water and, and a fire. If the fire is the size of a campfire, that bucket of water will go a long way to putting out. But, but when it turns into a full-on house fire, your bucket of water will have no effect. And that's, that's where we are at this point. So it spends its life under the bark, safe from pesticides. Only extreme cold will kill it. But with winters averaging one and a half to two degrees warmer, that's not happening. And only four to five percent need to survive and mature into adult beetles to sustain a growing epidemic. Forty billion dollars. That's the total value of BC timber that's been infested so far by the mountain pine beetle. And seeing as there seems to be absolutely nothing we can do to stop it, the potential losses will only grow. 
Tonight, in the final installment of our focus on this natural disaster, Brian Coxford tells us how the forest industry is scrambling to make sure it's not a total loss. The loads are lighter these days because they're filled with drier dead wood from a beetle kill forest. And mills in the center of our timber economy are targeting up to 100% of what is known in the interior as blue wood. We've got to put the dry wood into the mill and get the best recovery and best value out of it. We have to be able to run faster, so most of our equipment is designed to be able to go at a faster speed than what we had before. In the last few years, everything has changed here. The logging methods, new technology, cameras, scanners, computers, all deciding in a split second how to get the best cut out of the wood. It's necessary to stay competitive, facing the challenges of increasing productivity, processing structurally sound lumber, but one that brings a host of new problems into the mill. The defects and, and the dry wood just make it more difficult. Canfor's Vanderhoof Mill has had a high-tech makeover, turning it into a beetle pine operation. With trillions of beetles out there searching for food, logs are coming in in all ages and sizes. They die and dry before harvesting, making beetle logs lighter, more susceptible to breakage. It adds to downtime and necessitates new efficiencies. To have uh, the wood going to be there for the next 20 years with the different defects that are in it, we needed to make some changes to be able to address the wood basket that we have. At this mill, Canfor's invested over $100 million in new technology to attack the beetle problem. They've added staff, increased production just to stay in the game, because over time, the value of this beetle wood, some of it, will be lost. As mills adapt in a positive and productive way to the proliferation of beetle wood, so are log home contractors. A pine beetle log, planed and cleaned up to reveal the blue grain, not only adds value to the wood, but it's very much the in look for log homes today. A lot of people uh, are liking the, what they call denim pine. Um, it's environmentally uh, wise to use it, and it does, it's, it's dry, it's drier, so there's some less issues with seasoning and shrinkage settling. The world saw the beauty of beetle wood when BC erected a denim pine Olympic log home in Torino for the 2006 Winter Games. Contractors say their markets could be huge for blue wood if only they could get a guarantee of supply from the government and forest companies here. Currently we have seven people working for us and we could easily add three or four people a year over the next four or five years if we had a secure supply. Back in Vanderhoof, Allen M. Lumber has embraced the hardship of the pine beetle invasion, making sure it uses all of the log, lumber, bark, sawdust to its advantage. We produce lumber at our sawmill. We also take sawdust and shavings, and we produce wood pellets. And in addition, we take the bark from the uh, trees, and we produce heat to run our kilns and heat our mills. 100%. 100% of the log is used. At one end of the mill, the sawdust is heated and compressed into tiny beetlewood fuel pellets for local and international markets. The bags, 10% of the 450-ton daily production, is sold to use in wood stoves for heat. The remaining 90% goes to a co-generating plant in the Netherlands to produce heat and electricity. The exports fill five rail grain cars a day. Canfor's Vanderhoof Mill, along with its Houston operation, are two of the largest high-tech sawmills in the world. Other companies up here have also modernized to face the Beetlewood onslaught, believing efficiencies and innovations will get them through this tough period. Organizations that deal in how to uh, improve uh, recoveries from uh, damaged logs, how to improve the economics of transporting timber, harvesting and transporting timber, are very important to us right now. And that work will allow us to extend that economic uh, shelf life for lumber. The mountain pine beetles can't be stopped. It seems they have to run out of food. The dead pine they leave behind could still be good for 10, 20 years. We don't know for sure. We do know mills will be harvesting it to 2025, maybe beyond. In business news, OPEC has voted to cut oil production by more than a million barrels a day.